you back to the very beginning and talk about the team and all that stuff that you bring to the race. But um, the early plan uh, was to do what? Um, oh, the early plan, I think, was to run a more normal race, uh, kind of play it right down the center, um, a more traditional schedule. I didn't feel that this was a team that should try to leap out real aggressively in the beginning um, for a myriad of reasons. I didn't feel like the competition as a whole, I didn't think there was the type of players in there that I needed to be way out in front in the beginning. Um, I felt like the, the what gave us the highest chance of winning was to play a pretty standard early game and position the dog team and develop the dog team. And I did feel just the way that the last bit of the training season went for us, I felt like I needed to focus on finishing conditioning on the trail. And that's, I think, a, a good thing to know when you go into the race. Is this a team that is ready to launch off the starting block? Or is this a team that needs to do 40s and then 50s and build into it? And this was more the latter. So that's what the plan was. Is this based on the team that you bring, or is it based on – your other years racing and, and your philosophy, strategy, developing. I'm trying to draw parallels to mm -hmm. maybe your other races on this on this route. You know, what, I guess one thing to keep in mind is I, I want, I think we've talked about this before, I want to have as broad of an understanding of the sport as I possibly can. I want to continue to become a bigger and broader musher that has more tools in the toolbox, more of a technician rather than a hammer slinger. You know what I mean? Where... We can see the trail, we can see the team, we can see the competition, the weather, and all of those things, work them together to find the optimal plan, and then have enough experience and skill to execute the plan that would be best for this situation. Because one of the factors you have to consider is, this would be the best plan for the team, for the weather, for the trail, and the competition, but I'm not good at that style, or I'm not good in that area so it's the net sum of my ability plus the validity of that plan in the situation. So as I can raise my ability, it gives me more options, and we can come up with a higher net number. So, yeah, I mean, it's a combination of all that, and I felt like I've raced races like that. Going back to before I won the Iditarod in my first win were more conservative beginnings, and I felt like this team was more similar to the teams I had back then. And... Uh, so I kind of went back to my roots, I guess, on that, run a little more traditional race. And I think it would work really well. And I'm, in hindsight, I'm really glad we opted for that. I don't think it would have been smart to try to be out of Rainy Pass, you know, two hours earlier or something like that. Um, whose phone is that? I'm going to make sure my phone's turned off, too. <laughs> uh, the moose. Dallas and and I don't we have a, a great interview with you in Cripple so I don't yep. want to make you talk about that again unless you want to talk about it again and I know you've had a lot of days now to think about yep. all of that and and um, so where's your brain at with it like the the yep. night that it happened no I mean it was a crazy situation um, I think it hit me a lot harder than it ever has before you know and I don't know if that's just a combination of the year we've had where here we go again. It's another tragedy or you know trauma happening to us. Um, that the whole stress and anxiety of the race and getting out there. And you, that you, I usually handle pretty well, so I don't know that that's a huge, huge factor. But you are in race mode, which is different than training mode on familiar home trails. And there's more surrounding it. Obviously, you've got a ton of teams on the trail. Any one of them is going to come hurtling around the corner next. You know that was really. Uh, good for me, I think, the last yesterday, I talked to a number of mushers that had just finished the race, and every single one of them, the first thing they said was, that was a terrible place to have to deal with this. And that was good for me, because, you know, in my mind, everything was so blurred, and I was wondering, like, was it just my perception that it was a really dangerous section? And hearing it from them saying, that was a really dangerous place to have this happen was good confirmation. And I do think that me being there any second longer than I was or every second additionally that I was there, that that was putting us in, in a dangerous spot. It was putting other teams in a dangerous spot. It was putting my team in a dangerous spot. And so I feel 
a little bit validated that getting out of there was important. Um, I'm not saying that there aren't a million things that could have been done better. And you know, just earlier I was doing an interview and I you know, kind of likened it to Jeff Gordon, you know, glances at his phone and accidentally rear in somebody at a stoplight. <laughs> I mean, you, you can be a great driver and have the same normal mistakes that happen to everybody happen to you. And so we had a kind of a bad day there. Bad days happen. I've had some great days on the Iditarod. I think we had one just the other day, you know, and it's the way it goes. I've spent, I've got to be over 100 days on the Iditarod Trail now racing. Um, some of them are going to be some bad days. Some are going to be some, some good days. Uh, eventually, we got it all put behind us and went and took care of business and got the race won, which is what we was, had set out to do. So, yeah, it was a crappy night. And um, I'm so, so thankful that Baloo is okay. Yeah. You know, she's on the mend. Um, I'm so thankful that that wasn't six or eight dogs that got stomped, which it very easily could have been. And that was, I think, part of why it hit me so hard is I've seen these situations before. And when that moose is in the middle of the team, and this is a big, healthy moose, this is not the late winter moose that's too weak to get off the trail. We just startled it. It didn't have time to get off the trail. It was surrounded by dogs before it even knew we were there. And had that thing started spazzing when it was in the middle of the team and doing its smashing with its front legs, they stomp down and they try to pin wolves or coyotes or whatever it is that it thinks is attacking it. It tries to pin them and it has sharp, sharp hooves and they can punch right through a dog or any predator. Had it started stomping and spinning which they'll do um in the middle of the team that could have been eight dogs you know so i feel like as much as it's a tragedy and there was it's a terrible situation it could have been so much worse and then finally in hindsight we get to talk about the things that did go wrong and we ignore all the things that could have gone wrong in the moment you're looking at every possibility that is still potentially a problem for example what would where would we, what would we be talking about had I stayed there for 30 minutes and my team got loose? You know, they broke a line or the dogs were pretty freaked out as well, which oftentimes lead them to be aggressive or uh, defensive and that can cause fights. What if we had a dog seriously injured from that? Or a team did come down that trail. I mean, Travis was the next musher and he had a fast, powerful, hyped up team as we all did. And he piles into us, and we have a 32-dog ball. And that, you know, tragedy happens. So we got to also remember there's a lot of bad things that didn't happen mm -hmm. because of what did happen, right? And, again, I'm not saying it was handled perfectly or correctly or anything. I think the race judges made the only decision they could make in the situation. And uh, I'm just thankful that we got out of there with as few scars as we did. Uh, you're able to compartmentalize so much on this trail. And I'm wondering, that night and the coming days, was it harder for you to compartmentalize things than it's ever been? Do you know what I mean by that question? Yes, right. I do. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to say yes and no, uh, as always. Yes, it was harder to deal with compartmentalizing it. We did compartmentalize it, but what it – I guess the easiest way to say this is we compartmentalize this, but it's not compartmentalized into a small little shoe box. This was a freaking refrigerator box. Mm -hmm. So while it was compartmentalized, it still took up a lot of space. And it was a little bit harder to break my mind away from that situation. Usually I can spend an hour on the trail when it's a good time to think about it and process this and it's done. You know, or, or – have it compartmentalized and open that box and deal with what's ever in there and then put it back in the box. I'm coming into a checkpoint. I need to focus on the dog team. This one took a couple days and it was the entire time on the trail, not 30 minutes when it's a good time to deal with it. Um, you know, I think when we talked on my 24, you know, a lot of people are saying, you just got to focus on the race and do that. It's, in, in my mind, it's like, no, this is actually the time that I can deal with this. I need to be ready to rock and roll when I leave the 24. When I'm, you know, then once I left the 24, it's realizing, okay, this team needs to be rebuilt a little bit. They went a little farther than I would have liked into the 24. All right, so we've got another day. 
we got another day to deal with this stuff as I rebuild the team or just kind of casually moving down the trail. That's what needs to happen now. Um, but by the time we got to the river, I think we were ready to ready to do what needed to be done. And Dallas, you, you may not care at all about this next question, but from a, from a guy sitting on the outside looking in, uh, and I, I think really that interview in Triple Two and, and the, the coming days, the fans of this saw a different side of Dallas E.B., where all of these years I've heard so much that Dallas is so stoic, he's so serious or ultra focused in on competing. Mm-hmm. Uh, we saw a different side of you. It humanized you, I think, in a way that we hadn't seen. Do you agree with that? Do you care about that? Well, I don't know what the perception is or was, but I, yeah. I think I do know who I am. Um, and you're probably right. You know, when we're out here, we do interviews. I think anybody, when they're talking to a camera or, you know, we're, we're trying to be professional. We're talking about what's relevant or pertinent. Um, I do think I can be the coach my team needs when they need me to be that person. Um, you know, so there's times that they need you to be a certain thing. It's like my ability to recognize what they need and then fill that role for them, I think, is one of the things that causes us to do well in races. But personally, um, how I view myself, yeah, I'm a, I'm a pretty emotional person. And that's something I have always felt where mushers, which all right, we got the biggest, toughest state in the union, and this is the biggest, toughest event in the state. And it draws the rough and tumble cowboys that are going to go out there and come hell or high water. We're going to get the job done. And uh, we fully expect for it to be 50 below and miserable and we're not going to sleep and all that. And I, I think it's too easy to embrace that image and want to embody that image. And there's this callous kind of identity that I think is perceived by other, by mushers, by ourselves. And we think that's what we're supposed to be. But I found that a bigger person is not somebody who's just tough. Um, and what does tough really mean? What I see is the ability to feel what my dogs feel, to be empathetic, to be emotional, to be right there with them and feel that pain, to feel this stress, to feel the situation and then process that and handle that and still get up and get the job done. That is what tough is. Not putting the blinders on and ignoring discomfort and ignoring reality, ignoring that maybe your team is a little bit tired or that you are tired. You know, pretending you don't have weaknesses doesn't make them go away. And real strength is being able to turn and face those weaknesses and address them and acknowledge them and still being okay with it. That's strength. And I think that's what we try to do. So yeah, I'm I'm a pretty emotional person, especially on the trail. And that's not emotional in the sense of I'm all over the place and just an emotional wreck. No. It's re- emotional responsibility, right? Acknowledging it, seeing it, saying, okay, I need to take a minute and deal with this, and then we're going to be beyond it and be able to continue to function. So that's something I never want to lose. I don't ever want to be in a situation or be the person that just doesn't feel. That's not toughness. That's blindness. Toughness is feeling and caring and still being able to power through. Maybe you're that way in private before, but are you getting to an age in life where you're okay with the rest of us seeing it a little bit more? Good question. Um, Perhaps. I don't think trying to hide it is a good thing ever. Um, I don't want people to think of me in one way and be in another way because what that does is it starts to create this image that you feel obligated to live up to or a persona that you feel like you are doing and you're doing that for somebody else, which is a BS reason to do something. So I've tried very hard not to, you know, let the, Oh my goodness, you're an Iditarod champion. I might, you know, I've followed you since I was in grade school or I idolize you or what that doesn't make one difference about me. I'm still me. And I don't want to ever want to be the person that feels like, you know, all puffed up and have to fulfill this role and I can't do any wrong because everybody thinks I'm perfect. No, I'm a human and we make mistakes. I'm no different than everybody else, right? So I've tried very hard not to let other people's um, opinions and impressions change my feeling of 
you know, my feeling of self, if you will. And I think one of the informative and educational pieces of that was actually um, back in 2017 when we dealt with all this crap regarding the, the, the drug test stuff, right? All of a sudden, everybody absolutely hates you, right? You're the worst person on the planet. And they have zero information. They do not know the reality of the situation. Only I know exactly, you know, I'm, I'm the only person I suppose that is 100% certain that I did nothing wrong. Did nothing in there. But yet, people don't need to have information. They don't need to have facts. They just need to get, want to get <laughs> fired up. And when I realized how shallow these apparently very heartfelt expressions were, my logical brain says, well, if they're that fired up with zero information and they think I can, I'm the devil for this information, how is that person any different than the person who thinks I'm some sort of hero with zero information? So if I can disvalue or, you know, if I can disregard this opinion, isn't it only fair and equal and opposite to equally disregard the impressions that say, you know, I'm better than I am, right? So all of that just became kind of white noise. I'm me. I love mush and dog. I make mistakes. I have really good days and I have really bad days. And we make it down the trail. And I don't want anybody to idolize or look up to or whatever. If they can find inspiration in some of the things that we do, great. Um, if it helps them benefit their life, that's what I mean by great, you know. But for the sake of hearing a kind word, um, of course, it's always nice to hear, but I don't ever want to strive for that or certainly not do this race because of that and that's the big pitfall is if you become addicted to praise or you know adulations um, all of a sudden you're racing for very much the wrong reason and you will no longer find success in this race if you are racing because you want to be a star I'm racing because I want to develop great dog teams I want to coach them through hard times I want to <clears throat> I want to have those experiences have those challenges with dogs and grow from it. And if ever we drift from that base, we will not be as, nearly as good as I think we can be now and certainly not going to find success in this race. And it will only be disappointment the whole way through. Okay, so you leave Cripple. Uh, mm -hmm. And be transparent here as much as you can. You give yourself what percentage of a chance to still get there first? Um, is it 90, 10, 20, 80, 70, 30, 40, 60, 50, 50? You know, I, I didn't want to even put a number on it, but it wasn't good. It was a it was a low percentage. And part of it, part of my rationale there is that's not what's important right now. Um, if we're going to be successful, it's not going to be because we're fixating on winning the race it's going to be because we fixate on doing what the team needs right now the number one most important question you can ever ask on the idea is what does my team need right now and that's something across the board you know <laughs> answers are the easy part questions raise the doubt and so often mushers i think do a pretty good job of finding the answer but they're not very good at asking the right question so the question that needed to be answered at that point was, what does my team need right now? How do I get this team in condition to race, not how do I race this team? And what you spend your time thinking about is, is the solution you come up with. So, for example, leaving Cripple, it was pretty clear to me that this team was not a team that was ready to go do something crazy and try to make up lost time. It didn't matter anymore how that time was lost. The reality of the situation is we were three and a half, four hours behind the, the then leader. And eventually we would have to make up that time. But to be able to do that, I have to have a team that feels sharp, has zip and snap to them. And so the question that I needed to ask wasn't how do I make up four hours? The question I needed to ask is how do I get a team that's prepared to make up time, that's prepared to race? And if we fixate on that question, we come up with the solution of doing some short runs, some short rest, some really, they didn't need sleep. They just had 24 hours of sleep. They needed to flush lactic acid. They needed to get hydration. They needed to get calories into them and recharge those muscles and cells a little bit. Now, when we focus on that, we come up with the right answers rather than some strategic thing of 
trying to do a 60 or maybe a 70 mile run straight to Ruby. And then I can go from Ruby and do an insane push to Nolato and take my eight. You know, yeah, we would have caught up, but we would have been done right there. So I wouldn't have given myself a good chance, um, but that wasn't where I needed to focus on anyway. So let's reassess when we get to Caltag after we spend the next, you know, 200 miles or whatever it is, focusing on developing a team that's ready to ready to race. And we might be six hours behind. We might be eight hours behind, but I'll solve that problem when we get there and I'll have the tools to at least try to solve that problem if we build this team correctly up until that point. Do you have to shoot this team camera? No, she's got she's not shooting. Okay. So, like, looking back, and again, when I looked at it, I think, you know, Travis left, it was almost eight hours in front of you, and I know he's going out there to camp, so if yep. he sits there for three hours, wasn't his lead five hours? Sure, but he needed more than three. He needed um, more than three, okay. So I, I put him at four hours, four probably. Four hours, okay. You know, that would be a realistic thing. Yeah. And four hours and some trail miles. Yeah. You know, that's the other thing. So he's yeah. going to be four miles or four hours ahead. Plus the 10 miles or 12. Plus or whatever distance he's covered and the correlating rest that is owed yeah. having covered that distance. So it's probably closer to five hours. In fairness, yes, yeah. probably so. So <clears throat> are you staying on your free race schedule at this point? Are you starting to trim a little bit here and there? Or no, what, I mean, like, my, how's it all working? I don't think people understand how my free race schedule works. My free race schedule is a rough game plan that – Every single step has a dozen branches that go off that lead to, you know, different plans or different possible styles of running this section of the race, depending on what is the objective in this section of the race. So we've talked about this many times, you know, generally speaking, the first third of the race, you're kind of getting that team trail hardened, getting them ready to, you know, used to being on the, on the Iditarod and hopefully leaving your 24 with a team that's better than you started. The middle third's about positioning, the final third's about racing. Generally, that's true, but you may well find yourself leaving Caltag with a team that's not ready to race and a team that needs to be rebuilt, and now you're looking at, okay, how do I use between here and Koyuk to get these guys ready to race from Koyuk? So my pre-race plan is general and loose, but more it's about spending a whole lot of time thinking about every possible eventuality. So when you come up in some odd place out there sometime in the future, and you find yourself in a situation, it's very, very unlikely that this is a situation that I haven't already spent some significant time contemplating. For example, this year, I spent a bunch of time figuring out a strategy on the river that was completely inappropriate for this year because of the conditions on the river, because of the, the type of team I had, because of my team's condition when we reached the river. However, that plan is now in my head. And some year, I'm gonna look like a genius because on what seems like 10 minutes, we figured out this brilliant plan that just somehow magically fits that team, the weather, the conditions on the river that year. But I thought about it in 2024. It may not be implemented until 2030 or possibly never. And so that's where spending time making plans is not about having the plan this year. It's about having spent 10,000 hours thinking about plans and strategies and what ways to run the Iditarod and then drawing on that knowledge base when the time's appropriate. You get the Caltag. Travis, I think, goes out to Tripod or Old Lord. I'm assuming it was Tripod. Um, he was about halfway from Caltag to Tripod. Okay. Maybe and about so 13 miles, I think. You get in the front. Mm -hmm. How did that all go down? Like, where, where did you go? How long did you stay? Yeah, so I left Caltag um, on a short rest, about two and a half hours, which gave me a few, few – it gave me three options. And, and there was a few places on this race that I took the play that was not – perhaps even the best play, but it was the play that allowed me to adjust the most seamlessly once I would have the information gained from that next run. Um, for example, going out of Cripple, I went 35 miles, rested in an amount of time that depending on what they look like leaving that place, I had a few options to go to from there. Um, certainly leaving Caltag, I stayed for two and a half hours in Caltag, um, left there with the ability to camp, which means I'm going to stop. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't go all the way to Unalakia, I don't think, in any condition or any situation there. But it gave me tripod flats as an option, 27 miles, I think, out of Caltag. And that was my, the trail is absolutely terrible plan, right? And then, so I took a two and a half hour break, which gives us plenty of energy 
in a terrible trail to make it 27 miles. Camp there, which from there I can easily hit Unalakleet on another not too long of run, assuming the trail is still bad. Uh, plan B is you go to Old Woman Cabin, which is about halfway to Unalakleet. From there, you have a diverging plan. Again, depending on trail weather, you can go to Unalakleet, or you can go a little bit beyond Unalakleet, which sets you up for another method of running the coast. Um, plan C was you go to the 20-mile sign, which actually isn't there anymore. It's about 58 miles from Keltag, which sets me up for a straight to Shack Tulip shot if the trail's really good and the weather cooperates. The reality of the situation we got out there was the trail was pretty dang good for that section, and that section's always rough, but it was, you know, good by comparison to previous years. However, the temperature was cold. I saw 47 below in a couple low spots. When I got up and left Old Woman Cabin, it was 47 below and stayed there until the sun came up. So it wasn't so much the trail that made Old Woman Cabin the right choice, it was the temperature. And I do not like keeping a dog team on their feet for too long in those temps. It's really draining on the dog team, and that's a place that mushers often miscalculate how much extra effort 40 plus below zero adds to your team's, you know, job to get down the trail. So that was that was the plan from there. And once I landed in Old Woman, um, like I said, there was two options from there, which were Unilocleat or past Unilocleat. And I felt like now with this team, they were really snapping. We did a good job on the river of bringing them back to back to full power without losing position. In fact, we gained some position in there. And uh, so I was able to opt for the more aggressive option leaving Old Woman Cabin. Yeah, and you go through Unilocleat, you go through Shaktulik, and I found it interesting, you normally go to that shelter cabin on the mm -hmm. outside of Shaktulik, but you didn't. Is nope. that because there was no wind? It was No, calm. actually. Was, um, were you hiding? Like, what was the... Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, so... I was trying to, I didn't know the strength of Jesse Holmes' team at that point, who then seemed to be the, the next challenger. This is why it always cracks me up at the beginning of the race. People ask, you know, who are you watching? Who are you keeping an eye on? And I think I said a hundred times, you know, I don't know who I'm going to be racing. And, you know, it was Travis, and then it was Jesse, and then it was um, Matt Hall. And I don't think any of those would have been our first choice. You know, your natural inclination is to lean to, you know, last year's winner, Ryan, um, Pete Kaiser, you know, Aaron Burmeister, who, as it turns out, none of them were the, the main challenger. So what's the point of worrying about it until we get there and see who we're racing and then recognizing when that person that we're racing changes? So, um, you know, at that point I was racing Jesse Holmes, or at least he was the, the next closest musher, and I didn't know how strong he was. And if he, he's one that does often have tremendous speed. Um, so I started trying to eke a little bit of an edge um, in a few different ways and trying to drive a bit of a wedge on distance. So I went about eight miles past, eight, eight and a half miles past Unilocleet. And then I went 12, 13 miles past Shack Tulik, which set me up to then go 17, 18 miles past Koyak, which then sets me up to go all the way to White Mountain without stressing the dog team. Um, so I was figuring if he is a faster musher this year, then we're not going to need to play a game that my team can win. And I think that's something we've always done well on at the end of the race is finding a path to victory. How does this team win this race? And now was the time to think about that and to focus on that and give them their highest odds. I mean, I may have been able to mirror him and beat him just straight toe-to-toe, -to -toe, take the exact rest he takes outrun them on each run by 10 minutes, I may have been able to win that way, but I think um, this gave us the highest probability of winning. Is it that old woman you're like, holy hell, I got all these five hours back? Is that when it, you realize that you've evened the, the race up? Yeah, but there's there's two parts to that because it's it's kind of like physics, I guess. You have potential energy and you have stored energy and you have expressed energy. I don't even know if that's a term, but <laughs> I just used it. So there it is. Um, so there's the physical distance between two mushers, you know, and that's one side note. It is interesting now with the GPS trackers, everybody talks about the separation in miles, whereas growing up, it was all in time units, right? They reached this checkpoint an hour ahead. Now it's, oh, you're five miles ahead, yeah. right? Which is small change, but you know, technology. Yeah. So yes, I had physically caught up, 
but at what price? I took two and a half hours in Caltech. Jesse Holmes took four hours and 50 minutes or something. So while I'm physically ahead, does he have the stored energy to actually be in the stronger position? And that was the part we, we couldn't know at that time. But yeah, that was definitely a time of like, we're back in this. And um, I don't think anybody feels real comfortable, you know, any of my competitors feel real comfortable if we come in there and they see a dog team just hammer their food and we're right there with them. Um, you know, we've got a pretty good track record of racing the coast. Did you answer why you didn't go into the cabin and uh, outside of Shack? Not yet, no. Oh, okay. So, um, so thanks for reminding me. Oh, yeah. So we get aiming there. Um, the reports all the way up where we're going to have this storm, you know, with 55 below with wind chill factor um, Monday through Friday or Friday through Monday. I don't know what day of the week it was, but, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and that was my expectation for that crossing of Norton Sound between um, Shack Tulik and Koyuk. And certainly going into Shaktulik, we were getting crushed with a pretty pretty steady wind uh, right on hitting our side. So my my assumption would be that crossing Norton Sound is going to be rough. This is not going to be an easy crossing. So I stayed in Shaktulik longer than I would have liked to, getting my sled packed and actually rearranging stuff, kind of fig configuring my sled so that I can sit really low behind the sled. I've got that hard carbon sled, which is really good in the wind. Um, it doesn't, the sled bag, it doesn't have a sled bag, but sled bags will bag in that wind and create like a sail and really catch the sled and push it off track or create a lot of force pushing the wrong way or going straight head into the wind. But once I left um, Shack Tulik, the wind was not as bad as I thought it was going to be. It was actually quite pleasant <laughs> for that section of trail. And getting to the shelter cabin, I've stayed at that shelter cabin a number of times. Um, and it does not provide a wind block. There's a big old pinnacle rock, and the cabin sits right on top of it, and you're sticking up high, and the wind is way worse on top of that hill than it is at the bottom. Secondly, almost no matter what direction the wind's coming from, it circles and eddies around the cabin. So your thinking is that the best place is camp the dogs right next to the cabin, you know, but the truth of it is the wind just circles it, and look at any of those cabins. There's a big donut around the cabin with no snow that's because wind goes ripping through there <laughs> and it blows that all clean so i stopped at the bottom of the hill where in the past um i had noticed one year i went through there i'm like oh it's nice and calm here and then got up to the cabin and camped there and just got blasted by the wind the whole time and almost got up and moved my team which would have been a process so this year i camped at the bottom i found a nice kind of corniced edge and stuck them right next to the hill there and it was a touch breezy, but it wasn't unpleasant at all. And they got a really good rest. Also, that cabin is kind of like a big inside-out drum. So when your dogs are trying to rest beside it, if you're moving around in the cabin, there's invariably uh, snow machines with camera people that show up there, and they're stomping in and out of the cabin to interview you. And that's a foreign and strange sound for the dogs, and it keeps them awake. So for want of a cold cabin for me to be in, I'm not going to sacrifice my dog's quality of sleep so I think that's my new camping space pretty much all the time I don't know if it's worth going up to the cabin I'm, I like that little bottom cliff there Dallas you're no longer spending time in checkpoints right like you're you're finding these camps outside is is there some old school to this where you're you're hoping to not allow the competitor to see you or is this just the way your schedule lined up just the way the schedule lined up and going back to 09 I felt like that was one of the 09 was the first year that I was racing my own team, trying to be competitive in the Iditarod. Um, one of the things I was determined to do is run a schedule that's best for the dogs. The dogs do not benefit from being in a checkpoint. Um, they don't care if there's a nice warm building. They don't care if there's a pot of you know nice, delicious moose stew <laughs> inside. That doesn't help them one bit. And this is the, the nine days out of the year that more than ever, everything has to be about the dogs. I don't give two shits about my comfort, right? My job is to take care of them and do what's perfect for them. So if I can't honestly say that this is the best thing for this dog team, we're not doing it. I don't care if that means stopping 200 yards away from the shelter cabin and being out there with them. That, that doesn't matter to me. And I feel like going back to like 09 in that era, you used to see a lot of mushers go from Roan to Nikolai. You saw a lot of mushers go Caltech to Unilocleat. These were very, very common runs. And 
I think because so many of the good mushers did it, it gave permission to a lot of the rest of the mushers to do it that maybe didn't have the quality of teams to where that was the right play. And I felt like the mentality was too much checkpoint to checkpoint. And you can't honestly tell me that everybody thinks that doing this 70 mile run between, let's say, Roan and Nikolai is the exact right thing to do for their dog team. No, they're doing a 70 mile run because it's from one checkpoint to the next checkpoint, which the dogs don't benefit from. So I tried to break this race up um, and every race up. And what is the right distance for this dog team to go? If I'm going to go from here to here in four runs, let's divide it, you know, that number, the distance by four. And then we might make adjustments to that. Of, I want to give them a recovery run. Let's do a 30 mile in there and give them a good break. And that's going to up their spirits a little bit. Maybe it's a particularly rough section of trail. So 35 miles of this trail is equal to 45 miles of this trail because there's no hills over here or whatever the factors might be. The one thing that is harder for a dog team um, not being in the checkpoints is you have to carry your food and straw and fuel, the things that are provided in the checkpoint. So we do need to calculate that difficulty factor into you know, your plan. So for example, if it's 55 miles to the next checkpoint, Yes, it might be better to do a 50 mile run than a 55, but I don't want to carry food and supplies for 50 miles and stop five miles short of a checkpoint, right? Because that extra difficulty is actually going to make it harder for the dog. So um, it's just trying to figure out what's, what's the easiest way for the dog team to make it down the trail as quickly as possible. Um, the finish line. Yeah, it's here in Nome. Yeah. And uh, and I'm just thinking back on it, and there was more emotion out of you this time. Was it about number six? Was it about the adversities? Was it about the Denali Highway? Was it about the moose? Was it about life? Was it about Grandpa Dan still on the planet and the CVs being under that arch? What Was it all of it, Dallas? This year has been like none other on challenges and there's all the ones everybody knows about and there's a lot more that you know aren't really big news or public or what you know people probably don't know about so I'm just thinking there's this was a really challenging year and every time we got over one big challenge or trauma you know, we all get together and is, you know, well, this just happened. Let's acknowledge it. Let's process it. Let's deal with it. And then we're going to move forward. And we're going to move forward together. And we would just kind of be more or less over and starting to catch our stride again. And then, boom, you get hit again. Hit again. Hit again. Well, this has to be the end of it, right? All right, we've had this whole this bad luck this year, guys. Um, you know, here's what happened. Here's how we're going to deal with it. We're going to take our time to grieve or to recoup or whatever it would be. And then, you know, tomorrow we're going to go do this. We're going to take care of these dogs. We still have all these other dogs that rely on us. we got to hold it together for them. We've got this job to do. And the Iditarod, in a lot of ways, served as this unifying factor for the humans in our group. Um, and it really kind of held everybody together and pulled us towards this goal. And so we finally make it to the start of the race, and all right, we've had one hell of a year, guys. You know, let's go get this done. We've, if anybody's earned it this year, we have, right? We deserve to go freaking crush this thing. Then right off the bat, <laughs> nope, this year ain't over. Um, another, another traumatic event. Another dog, in, you know, in mortal peril. Um, and I'm so thankful that she's recovering as well as she is but um here we go again you know and i think it was all of that and i just wanted to get it done for the people that have put so much into this the dogs that have put so much into this and um and i think that that's what you saw at the finish line was we got it you know we had a million things happen bad this year um and a lot of them could have been worse than they were and i'm so thankful for that like the snow machine thing obviously it's a tragedy and it's it's terrible. We lost two dogs. We had three more critically injured that will never be 100%. Um, and it's really easy to look at the bad thing that did happen, but let's look at the bad things that didn't happen. The person on that team is still alive. The person has their legs. 
there were several other dogs in that team um, that didn't die, that didn't get, you know, terrible injuries. There were several more that did have injuries, but they weren't, you know, super bad. So, anyway, I think what you what you saw, saw at the finish line was the relief that we had something good happen, um, that we were able to pull it together. I felt like our people deserved it. Our team deserved it, and I felt really proud to bring that home for them. Um, you know, there's one moment on this trail towards the end when it was getting really tough. Um, I think I've talked about it. This, this team is a little bit different than some of the teams I've had in the past. I think it required more of me as a driver with this team to, um, to coach them correctly, partially because I have dogs from my dad's kennel helping to fill the void from the ones that we lost. So it's a, a little bit of a split team that way. They didn't train together all year. There's some dogs that, because again, because of that void, um, there are some dogs that haven't made my team in the past, that this year were not just making the team, but pretty far up the ranks, um, not because they were improved tremendously, but the, the average quality of the team, I think, was a little bit lower because of you know, losing some athletes. And just a cycle that we have in the kennel. We didn't have a lot of young talent coming in, and we had some really good dogs retire this year. So uh, there was a point on this race where they were feeling it. It was hot. The trail was slow. It's really easy for dogs and people to get depressed in that situation because um, you're just walking along at five and a half miles an hour, and you know they'll pick it up when the sun goes down. And And I had a nice long conversation with my dogs, and I just – I think it was more for me than them, but um, just explain what happened this year. Just walk through it all. Every bad thing, every good thing, every happy time, downtime. But a lot of it was not great stuff, right? And I explained to them, and I think, again, I was talking to them, but half of it was talking to myself, that um, it was on us now. And we needed to make it worth it. Um, there's a lot of people that were relying on us. A lot of dogs that had put their best effort forward and maybe aren't on this team or aren't on the team now, but they helped us get to the starting line. They helped us become who we are, become the team we are, and we owe it to them. We got to get this job done, and I need two good days. We need two good days. We need to close this thing. And I don't think they understood the words that I said, but I think they understood the intent that I had, and I think they understood what I needed from them. And they freaking took off. You know, they, I know them so well. They know me very well. And that was a pretty awesome moment. Like, it was really cool to see. They understood. And, uh, like I said, they didn't understand the words, but they understood the, the ask. Mm -hmm. And they responded. And from there on, we flew. Um, the lead got bigger and bigger, and we came under the finish line. It was all of it. It was what this team did to honor the ones we've lost, to honor the ones that gave all their best effort to help get us here, the people that have put in thousands of hours to care for the ones that are here on the trail and to care for the buddies that were on the team too. Um, and they were flying the banner, and that, that's pretty heartwarming <laughs> when you see them do that and do it for their team and do it for themselves and do it for you. That's a real bond, and it's hard not to get emotional getting to see that play out. So when we crossed under the finish line or coming up through the chute, I think it was all that, all that pent up, and, you know, out it comes. <laughs> so it, it was a pretty awesome trip. You love these dogs, though. Yeah, they they are my life, you know. I think I love them because they're so honest. They they love what they do. They don't have ego. They don't have pride. They don't have anything but desires, and they're so open to just this is who they are. And if they're having a good day, they show it. If they're having a bad day, they show it, and uh, they're all okay with that. And they want to do their best, you know. They want to do their best. They want to fly down that trail they want to feel good and do good and anybody who gets to work with that sort of a being is should be should count themselves as very fortunate 
from what I just heard, I'm assuming number six pales in comparison to what you just described. Yeah. Right. Like it. No, I mean number six is great. I'm excited for it, but um, it's the journey. It always is. Yeah. Six is just a number. These dogs are, you know, heart and soul and feelings and they're beings, you know. And so to see them fulfilled um, and to feel like we did them right and that we did our job and served them and um, allowed them to show their best self, that's that's what <laughs> you get stoked about. And I think I would have been just as proud if the goal was to finish. And, um, and I felt like they really pulled together and did their best and we accomplished our goal. It just so happened to be that I've been doing this for a long time and I had some really good dogs and the goal was to win it. So the, the, the fact is that we were excited because we accomplished our goal. And that goal and this year was to win, and this year happened to be six. And someday I'm sure it'll be nice to look back at, a, at the wins and remember them. But what I remember from these races is the teams. And I've said it before, it's, it's creating those teams that's the real joy and passion. The race is fun. I enjoy racing. But uh, what keeps us coming back is developing these teams. It's, it's my form of art. I'm artistic, I think, um, but I can't sing. I can't draw. <laughs> I don't do poetry. I don't, you know. So my art form is creating teams, creating a group of athletes, dogs, to go take on a huge challenge and be there with them and experience that with them. And it is an art form that doesn't last. Each one's unique. It's it's not painting some great mural or painting that's going to hang on the wall for a thousand years um it's creating something that's finite and short-lived you know today each of those dogs are different than they were yesterday next year it'll be a different team it may in, can be comprised of many of the same individuals but they'll all be a year older and a different life phase and they'll have different needs and to be a good coach for them i will have to adjust and understand what they need today not what they needed last year so we create this ice sculpture that's made to melt, right? It's not supposed to last. And I think that's one of the truest art forms because it's about the creation, not about the finished product. It's about making that team. It's about that journey and the challenges that come along with it, not suffering through making them so that you can have something at the end. That's not the point. The point is enjoying the creation of it. Uh, let our fans know how they find your tour business and how they get a hold of you this summer and the future if they want to come see your operation. Yeah, so now the race is wrapped up and done. Um, we're going to take some time to celebrate and enjoy it and uh, recuperate. And then we all have to go back to work, <laughs> dogs and me. So we do tours in the summertime um, and in the winter as well, but primarily in the summer in Talkeetna, we do dry land mushing. Um, custom wheeled sleds that guests can drive. And uh, I think we're the only place in the summer that allows people to mush their own dog team and actually get to experience what I just got to do for the last, you know, all winter. And, you know, many of these same dogs, they, they're blue collar dogs, you know, they're going to be there working all summer long. And uh, so you can find that information at um, sleddogtours.com or dallastv.com. We also do helicopter glacier tours so you take a helicopter up land on a glacier in june july august may um and there we have a lot of our race dogs up there because they like being on the snow and it's more of a physical workout uh, get a get a dog sled ride on a glacier on snow in july it's a pretty amazing experience it's amazing how many like wedding proposals or marriage proposals we get on that tour it, it is really is such an epic yeah. setting and surrounding and it's a once in a lifetime activity so uh again Information is at sleddogtours.com. And um, the other thing that I do is a, a lot of public speaking stuff, you know, corporate type events or all sorts of events, really, and uh, on a broad spectrum of topics, but mostly teamwork and leadership. And, you know, some of it is overcoming adversity and challenges. And, um, and so that information is there as well. Thanks for your time. Thanks for being you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Dallas CV. Oh, yeah.